Well, thank you, Judy, for uh, reading the words so eloquently. And uh, I was a bit scared now coming up <laughs> after hearing that. <laughs> um, which I think is always important that if you're fearful coming up to the pulpit, then that's probably a good start because we are dealing with the eternal word of God, aren't we? So let us, uh, let us come before the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father God, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Uh, be with each and every one of us. May your Holy Spirit illuminate in our lives the truth of who God is and who we are in God. And so, Father, with this, with these things, be with this preacher that he preaches your word faithfully and true. And for this we pray. Amen. Amen. The disciples were having all these questions. This was the last supper had happened. Well, not that we they knew it was the last supper, but it was the supper had, had, had happened. And uh, Luke covers that in, in Luke and uh, covers that in beautifully where he says, this, this, this bread is my, is my body and then the wine is, is, uh, this, this wine is, is, is given for you. This is my blood of the covenant. John records that they have all these questions, which is good. I'm glad that the disciples ask these questions because these are questions that we ask ourselves today. So the disciples had questions for Jesus in his hour, because his hour had come. A bit like, well, Jesus, you've been telling us all these things over the last three years, and we're trying to put them together, but we have no clue of what you've been on about. I think we've got an idea, but it seems distant. It seems weird. It seems, I don't know how it all fits together. They knew about the Father and that the Father was really important. But to have access to the Father, well, their understanding of that was you had to go through the temple. You had to go and see a priest in the temple who would then make access so you could go to the Father. And it all seemed very complicated. And it all seemed very distant. It all seemed very, oh, just too much to bother with. The thought of actually having direct access to the Father, God the Father, seemed impossible. Yet Jesus kept on speaking about that it was possible. And in fact, speaking about that the Father and him are like one of the same. Like, it's extraordinary. And the disciples knew of the account of Moses because they were very good Hebrews. And of how God had, had, had passed, you know, uh, Moses had been hidden in, hidden in the cleft of the rock and God had passed by and it was just an incredible experience. They knew of Isaiah, they, they knew of Jeremiah, these big major prophets who had visions of God, Isaiah in particular, who then had uh, this vision of God. Oh, but who, who is going to go and do this, says Isaiah? Because I'm a man of unclean lips. So with all this talk about the Father, and, and they've worked out that Jesus was the Christ, but how did that relate to the Father? How was this? It was all a little bit confusing. So if Jesus is the Son, he seems to have a bit of the, a bit of, a bit of the inside lane here, Maybe they can get a bit of an inside lane in two and maybe see the Father because this had happened previously. And Jesus keeps on talking about the Father. So maybe we could see the Father. Maybe we, we could be, have that unique possibility. We could go down in something like the, uh, something like the annals of, of time, that we'd be one of those. We'd be like Isaiah. We'd be like Jeremiah. We could be like Moses. I've seen the Father. Extraordinary. This was the reason why Philip asked his questions. All we want to do, Jesus, 
is see the Father. That's, that's all. We want the spectacular. Because that's what happened before. We want to have the spectacular. Jesus, you speak of the Father all the time, but what does the Father look like? What, does the, what is the Father like? What does the Father want us to do? Just show us. And uh, she'll be right, mate. She'll be right, mate. We, 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 we'll know what to do then. Well, Jesus has a response for them. And I'm going to talk about his response under three headings. The Trinity, the relationship of love, and how does this relate to me? So let's think about the Trinity. This is not some boring theological lecture. This is real. This is real because this is who we are connected with. So Jesus' response to Philip's question is on point, as per normal. Jesus responds that you have witnessed with all of your senses of who I am and what I am. You have seen, you have heard, you have watched, you have smelt. Everything that has happened, you have seen. And what I have done is the Father in me. You have seen me. So you have seen the Father. For Jesus does the work of the Father. Jesus expresses the attitude of the Father in all circumstances. The words Jesus speaks are the words that the Father gives to Jesus to speak. They are not his alone. Or we could say that the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father. For seeing me, Jesus says, you have seen the Father. What an extraordinary statement to make. For the Son and the Father are the, are the same divine, I'm going to use the word substance, because there's a reason why I'm going to do that. Yet they are different persons. Same divine substance, different persons. The Son is not some representative of God, not a prophet of God, not an angel of God, but is the Son of God. The Son, the same substance, the same divine substance as the Father. Not a prophet, not an angel, the Son. The Son. There has always been great confusion about how the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit relate. At the time of the writing of the Nicene Creed, because the early church was trying to understand, uh, we can picture Jesus as, well, is he, is, he, is, he, is he totally spirit? Because if he's totally spirit, then, because the physical realm then means that that's just evil type thing, because that was Gnosticism. There was the other side that said, no, Jesus has no spirit at all. He was just a guy, like any other guy. But Jesus, but, but God said, actually, he's pretty special. He'll become my son. Jehovah Witness hold that position. At the time of the writing of the Nicene Creed, one of the theologians trying to explain how the three persons of the Trinity are related was that they are of the same divine substance. The term used was, the term used was homoousius, same substance. For some, they considered that the Son was purely spirit, while for others, they considered that the Son of God was just a man. One of the theologians, a guy called, a guy called uh, Athanasius, argued that the Son of God was fully human and fully divine at the same time. And friends, still is fully human and fully divine at the same time. It was argued that the Father and the Son of the, uh, are of the same substance because, what did Jesus say? You have seen me, you've seen the Father. And that the Son of God took on flesh to become fully human and fully divine at, at the same time, without confusion. Or we could say this way, 
if you're thinking mathematical, the Son of God is 100% divine, fully divine, and 100% human, fully human, at the same time with no confusion. That doesn't mean he's 200%. It just means that he's fully human and fully divine without confusion of, 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 of substance or anything out of nature at the same time. Does that, does that make sense? Do, do you, does that, can that ring a bell? Can you sort of understand that, that sort of perception? Fully human, fully divine, the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, has got, has got a name which, which uh, Mary was told to name him because he's God saves, Jesus, and he is the Christ. He is the Christos. He is the Messiah, the Chosen One. Jesus Christ. So 100% fully human, 100% fully divine at the same time without confusion. I can't stress that enough. <laughs> and it's an important for us to, to, to know this. So Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, as John 1, 14 to 18 de declares, and has appeared to all. So by seeing the Son, they have in fact seen the Father. And by seeing the Son and by believing in the Son, those who believe receive the gracious gift from the Father. And the gracious gift from the Father is eternal life. Life in the Father. For the Son is the way to the Father, the truth revealed about the Father, and the life given by the Father. So the Son of God was the physical paraclete or companion with the disciples. The, Jesus was the one who was with them, travelling around Palestine, um, Israel, all, all that time. But there will be another paraclete, another companion, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Truth, who will be a companion to, to the disciples as they take the message of the Son of God beyond the borders of Israel to the world. And this will be a great, uh, this will be a greater work than what Jesus was ever able to do. Jesus was never able to go beyond the borders of Israel. He could have. But going to all the world, like, it would take a nation, a holy nation. It would take a people who had been called by God. It would take a royal nation of people called by the Father, redeemed by Christ the Son of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring millions of others to know God and to make him known. A greater work than what Christ was ever able to do. That's our job today, by the way. So we should be glad that Philip asked this question because it's a question that many have asked throughout the ages. It also raises the question of how the Father and the Son relate. Well, let's think about this, think, think about this relationship. What is it based on? If the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are, are of one substance, yet three distinct persons, they are identical in substance, but they have different roles. The Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father. The Spirit is in the Father, and the Son and the Father and the Son are in the Spirit. They are three independent persons, yet they are of the same substance. They are three persons, yet one substance. They have three roles, yet they are one substance. The three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are bound by love. That's what binds the Trinity, is love. And this love is expressed through actions performed by each of the persons in the Trinity. The Son loves the Father and does exactly what the Father asks. In this way, the Son glorifies the Father. The Holy Spirit loves the Father and the Son by leading people to understand the truth of who God is 
And the Father loves the Son and the Holy Spirit by sending them both. But, but, but the Father loves the Son and the, and the Holy Spirit by sending them both, for the Father loves his creation. And the Son's role was to redeem what had been created. This could only happen if the Son loved the Father and did as the Father commanded. For the commandment of the Father is driven by love. Love is, the, love is, is what binds the Trinity. And John 3.16 summarises it, doesn't it? That out of love for this world, God sent, God commanded, this is my son. That out of love for this world, God sent his son. And the son's role was to be God with us. God with us. By reversing the effect of the fall of Adam and Eve. In the garden, someone had to live a perfect life, and the only one who could do that was the Son of God. So, the Son of God was sent by the Father with love for this world to do what no person could ever do. What we also know is that the reversal of the fall, which led to death, could only be made possible. If the one who is sinless and gave their life as a sacrifice and a life was given so life could be given to all who believe in the Son of God, in Jesus Christ as their Saviour. For the Son reveals the Father and the Holy Spirit reveals the truth of this matter. Are you still keeping up with me? You still keeping up? Good. So the life given needed to be needed to be one needed to be from one who was without sin and there was only ever one option there was only ever one option and that is the son of god who would enter this world in the usual way that is by being born but the woman well she was unique for she was a virgin betrothed to be be, 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 be betrothed to a man. From the time of Eve, the promise of a child being born that would crush the serpent's head was realised with Mary, a virgin betrothed to Joseph, a carpenter. The birth had to be in Bethlehem, the city of David, as prophesied in the Old Testament. And on that day, angels surrounded the area and a group of shepherds that the Messiah had been born. These angels went and told, we, we, we know that story, at Christmas time, where they you know, all get up and dress up as shepherds. And the angels come around. The angels were normally up in heaven, worshipping, gathering around the Son of God. And now they came because he was the Messiah being born on earth. Of course they're going to be around there. They're going to be giving praise. They're going to be singing this is the son. This is not a prophet. This is the son. This is who it is. A group of shepherds that the Messiah had been born. So widespread was this news that Magi from the, from the east, men who looked to the stars and knew the prophecies through Daniel, they saw it in the stars and they came bearing gifts. King Herod, the Jewish ruler at the time was furious that another king had been born. So he had all male children under the age of two killed. This boy Jesus, though, was not going to be stopped by some headstrong political leader. Correct. So Joseph came to know these things through a dream and took Mary and Joseph and took Mary and Jesus to Egypt, for the hour of Jesus had not yet come. Advanced 30 or so years, and here was Jesus with, with the 11 disciples in the upper room, having shared supper with them, as when Jesus says to them, My hour has come. My hour has come that the Son of Man must be glorified. 
And Jesus' glorification was to go to the cross as the sinless saviour. The Father would glorify the Son because Jesus had done everything asked of him. For his hour had come. For the Son loved the Father, and the Son commands those that believe in, to, believe in the Father to do as what has been commanded because of love. So what does this, how does this all relate to me? Can I just make a statement first of all? The gospel is love. I know love has been pushed around in the last decade or so about all sorts of strange and connotations. The gospel is love, unadulterated. First and foremost, it's not about following a bunch of rules or living a moral life. The gospel is not a bunch of rules or living a moral life. It is not that. If you ever thought that the gospel is, I just need to live a good life and that'll be fine, cross that out. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. It is simply love. The primacy of this, of this statement is that it is out of love for this world that God sent his son. Out of love for those that believe, the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. Christian, do you know today that Christ is in you because the Spirit of Christ dwells in you? Do you know that, Christian? The Spirit of Christ dwells in you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that, Christian? Do we need to remind ourselves? I need to remind myself every morning. Yes, the Holy Spirit is actually in me. The Spirit of Christ dwells within me. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the one who has paid an awful price. And this is such a game changer, friends. Prior to, di prior to this, people were were distant to, distant to God, for they had to go through such a complicated way to approach God. Even today, there are people who say, you can't go to God without first coming through me. Rubbish, I say. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. You can go direct to the Father. We don't need to put up barriers in front of people. We don't need to go through a priest to be, come to the Father. We have a great high priest, the Son of God. Friends, we, we just need to have this in our heads. God is not distant. And it's not complicated to approach God. Yet in Christ... We have direct access to the Father. For Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the Holy Spirit, friends, get this, the Holy Spirit makes this truth known in our hearts. Because it is the Father who calls. And Christian, do you know that the Spirit of God the spirit of truth dwells inside of you. Your body is that temple. And just, the, just as the Son is in the Father and vice versa, well, the Holy Spirit is in the Father and the Son. So now, Christian, the Spirit of God dwells in you. And through the Word of God, uh, speaks the Holy Spirit speaks truth into our lives. Can we say this? And we can say this, Christian, you are included. Everyone talks about inclusiveness these days. You are included, Christian, in the accomplishment of God's will. It is the Trinity and me. It is the Trinity and me. How do we know this? Well, Jesus made two observations about this. First one's this. If you love me, then you do what the Father has planned for us. 
Well, what on earth is God's plan for you? It's the age-old question, isn't it? I don't know what the Father's planned for me to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. What, what is God's will for me to do? Well, the Holy Spirit will lead you into that truth in each and every situation. If you love me, Jesus says, then you will do as I have commanded. And what has Jesus commanded us to do? Two things. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbour as you love yourself. You see, Jesus gave, gave us the demonstration of this love in action. For it was love for this world, for God's neighbour. Ever thought of that, that we are God's neighbour? For God's neighbour, that Christ came and redeemed the redeem the creation. The Gospels reveal this in different places of, of how Jesus acted. The actions were the actions of the Father. Therefore, as we come to the situation, we must ask ourselves, what will be the actions that demonstrate the love of the Father for this world? I know other people would say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? But what is the love of the Father? What is the actions of the love of the Father for this world? Or to use the language of John, how will our actions glorify the Father through the Son as directed by the Holy Spirit? We know what Jesus did. So what should I do? Well, may the Spirit of truth lead us through each situation as, as we come across it. And it's going to be different for each and every person. You cannot, you cannot say, I did this and this one, so you need to do the same. Well, there might be some generalisations there, but it's the Holy Spirit who leads you into each and every situation. And friends, can I say that the second way, we, uh, the second observation that we have is prayer. Jesus asked us to pray to the Father through the Son and led by the Holy Spirit. Our prayers are not to tell God things that are not true. Rather, our prayers are for each and every situation that will accomplish greater things than what Jesus did. So what does this mean? Will we do more spectacular things, greater things than what Jesus ever did? Well, hardly. The miracles that Jesus performed or the signs that, that, that John uses this word are uh, for us to understand who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God. That's what the signs are there for. So I, signs pointing that, that, friends, I'm going to tell you who the Son of God is. And I've written a book about it. And there's many other books that I could write about that. But these particular signs. But does that mean we're going to do greater things than these? No. Rather consider this. Christians are called to go and make God the Father known because of what the Son has done and where the Holy Spirit leads us. You know, Christians are sent to the world to make disciples, of bringing people who do not have a personal knowledge of the Father into having an intimate relationship with the Father. That's the greater work. That's the greater work. Our work is to connect people who, who do not know God to then being able to say, may the Lord, through the Holy Spirit and the Son redeeming, that they have a relationship with the Father. It's to know God and to make him known. That is our work. And it's a greater work, and it's, and it's for the whole world. It's not just for a particular situation. It's not just for one little place. It's for the whole world, wherever that may be. In Ecuador or um, where are the computer's going to? Or to the Congo. Wherever the Lord leads us to, wherever the Holy Spirit says, you go here, because that's where I'm sending you. And this is the mission for you to make disciples, to, to, to make known God to people who did not know God 
so that they know God forever and have life and enjoy him forever. That's our job. And it's greater than what Christ was ever able to do. So Christians are sent to make the central world to make disciples of bringing people who do not know have a personal knowledge of the Father into having an intimate relationship with the Father through the Son as the Holy Spirit dwells within them. And we as Christians have that privilege to do that today. So Christians are not called to do nothing, but we are called to go beyond the borders of Palestine and to the ends of the world. We are to pray to seek the lost and for the Spirit of Christ to bring conviction of sin and confession of faith in God the Father as made known, known through the Son and given light and life through the Spirit of truth. And that is how we should pray. So why should we pray and act like this? For we have not been left as orphans. We have not been left to our own devices or vain attempts. You see, we have not been left as orphans, for the Father has adopted us into his kingdom. The Heavenly Father is our Father. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, has paid an incredible price for you. And the Spirit of Truth continues to make this known to each and every one of you, prompting and inspiring each of you to pray. And why can we do this? For the Son of God has returned to the Father. The Son sits on the right hand of the Father. So your prayers come before the throne room of God. Your prayers have the authority of the High King of Heaven. Your prayers come directly to the Father by, re by the request of the Son of God and led by the Spirit of Truth. Your prayers are Trinitarian. And the Trinity expects you to pray, for it is the Trinity and me. Amen. Shall we pray? Father God, as we come to consider all that we have heard this morning, may we always remember that it is you that has started this work, that you have called us to be your people, that we are the people of the risen King, and that our prayers and our actions are from the High King of Heaven. And we thank you, Lord, that you love us and you love us with, and you love us with, with, with a love that knows no boundaries and that chases us and brings us to our knees. As was prayed before through the wastelands of that, of that other land, you have